Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, continuing our fortnight of Mars, we have a pair of special guests offering us a look at both the present as well as the future of Martian exploration. First, we welcome Martian geologist Dr. Kirsten Seabach back to the show. She'll give us a first-person look at how the Perseverance rover will explore the landscape of Mars. We're also going to talk with Dr. Fatima Ibrahimi from the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. We'll discuss her work designing a new plasma engine capable of bringing spacecraft and people to Mars and beyond. But first, we take a look at the arrival of NASA's Perseverance rover on Mars. This is the third mission to arrive at the Red Planet in the last two weeks. We also look at a new study showing microbes are able to survive and thrive within Martian soil. Finally, we'll journey out to the TOI 451 star system where three newly discovered planets await our watchful gaze. On February 18th, the Perseverance rover successfully touched down on the surface of Mars. This one-ton SUV-sized robotic spacecraft is the most advanced rover ever to land on the Red Planet. Perseverance will search for signs of water or possible evidence of ancient life which may have once lived on Mars. The rover set down on Jezero Crater, the site of an ancient lake. This mission includes the lander, rover, and the first helicopter ever designed to fly on another planet. We talk with Dr. Kirsten Seabach, Martian geologist, who is one of the people who will be driving the Perseverance rover around Mars. So can you just tell us a little bit about Perseverance and some of the tools aboard the spacecraft that are gonna help you explore the Red Planet? Yeah, Perseverance is our newest mission to the Red Planet. It's a rover about the size of a small SUV, and it's modeled right after Curiosity, so it'll be very similar looking to Curiosity generally, but Perseverance has a new mission, and it's to search for uh, signs of ancient life and to collect samples from, collect core samples from the ground and place those, it'll actually end up placing those back on the ground on Mars, mm. Uh, for a future retrieval mission to go pick up those samples. And those will be the first samples intentionally returned from Earth to Mars for us to study. Uh, so those are the two key parts of the Perseverance mission to, to look out for. Yeah, it's so cool. I mean, you know, you're basically putting, you know, this SUV sized car, you know, on, on Mars to just roam around and search. So, I mean, there's a lot of landmass on Mars, and uh, why'd you choose to zero crater? What makes what makes that spot so special? Yeah, Jezero Crater is an ancient crater that used to contain a lake that was about the size of Lake Tahoe, and when when that lake was active, there were these rivers flowing into the lake from a couple different directions. And those rivers were sourced from areas that are some of the oldest, the most ancient terrains on Mars. They're actually older rocks than any rocks we have preserved on Earth. Um, and those rocks are also a great place for life to start. They're really ancient rocks where hot water was interacting with volcanic rocks. And those came down in this river into this large lake. And so both the lake environment and the upstream environment are really exciting ones that we haven't been able to explore on Mars this far. Jezero Crater is, is rough and rocky. It's geologically really exciting, but pretty hard on the engineering side. And so we actually did not have the capability to land at this site with any previous mission, but we've updated our landing capabilities. And so now we can go to this geologically really exciting site. 
That's so cool. And you mentioned, of course, water, which is sort of the, you know, $64,000 question here, you know. And um, so we've seen it, you know, seen evidence of water on Mars in different forms and some new research is suggesting there could be small thimble sized pockets of salty, you know, water, water still hidden a couple meters beneath the surface. Will, um, will Perseverance be able to differentiate different forms of ice under the ground? And how's it go about doing that? Yeah, great question. So, in, yeah, water on Mars is, is the million dollar question. Uh, and the present day water on Mars is, is mostly ice and gas. If, if there is any in a liquid form, it's only because it's in a very salty solution. Um, Perseverance is landing in an area that's close enough to the equator that ice isn't stable. And so ice is unlikely to be found at the Perseverance site. That said, the samples that Perseverance collects formed in an ancient lake. And so in the rocks themselves, uh, there are hydrated minerals or minerals that contain tiny amounts of that water from the lake uh, that we'll be able to investigate when they come back to Earth. Uh, Perseverance also has what's called a ground penetrating radar. It has a, a radar, so as it drives around, it'll be able to kind of send these signals down and they'll bounce off of any interesting layers that are present in the kind of couple tens of meters below Perseverance underground. Uh, so that will give us a new measurement of what's going on under the surface in these equatorial regions where ice isn't stable. That's so cool. And one of the one of the things I absolutely love about this mission, and it may be my favorite part, is the Ingenuity helicopter. This is going to be the first helicopter to ever fly on another planet. Um, and what um, what are we hoping to get out of that? Besides, you know, learning how to fly helicopters on other planets. Complete excitement, yeah. <laughs> as if that weren't enough. <laughs> yeah, Ingenuity is this, uh, yeah, as you said, it's a little rotorcraft. It's the first helicopter that will fly on any other planet. It's it's tucked underneath Perseverance's belly. So as Perseverance lands, it'll, it'll be down near the ground and Perseverance will kind of drive from the landing site and drop Ingenuity. So that Ingenuity then, and drive a little ways away. So Ingenuity then has space to fly and it has, multiple rotors so that it can actually fly in the Martian atmosphere, right? This is like right. flying a drone or a helicopter in an atmosphere that's thinner than we have at the top of Mount Everest, right? This is, it's actually really challenging <laughs> just to show that we can fly. And so we, we believe it will fly. It's gonna come out, it's gonna fly up in the air. Uh, we'll get pictures with it and, and send those back. And once we've proven that technology, once we've shown that we can in fact fly a rotorcraft on another planet, it really opens up this whole new window for future missions. So hopefully we'll be able to develop drones with more and more science capabilities to send in the future. Right, and of course that type of technology would be ideal for let's say Titan. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. and yeah. that's the next one that's planned. <laughs> right, right. And so as, you know, as uh, Perseverance is, you know, scouring the ground and beneath the ground, um, how, what capabilities does it have to find habitable zones or, you know, zones that may have once been habitable or possibly even signs of ancient microbial life? Yeah, great. It's great. So it's slightly different, right? So the last mission we've been following is the Curiosity rover, and that's called Mars Science Laboratory. And its purpose was to drive around and, and accomplish as many laboratory tasks as possible. And Perseverance, because of its main goal to collect samples, won't have those laboratory capabilities on board, but instead is all about surveying, identifying the right samples, and then putting them in, uh, putting them in little containers and sending them back to Earth. So what it can do is instead, we've really upgraded the survey instruments. So mm -hmm. I mentioned the ground penetrating radar, we'll be able to understand kind of what's going on in the tens of meters underground, but above ground, we're gonna use cameras and we also have a, a super cam, which is a laser that can zap rocks again about seven or a couple feet away to about 20 feet away. That can tell us what they're made out of. It'll zap a little spot on the rock into a plasma and then look at the plasma with the infrared spectroscopy 
that tells us the composition. But also we can drive up to different spots. And what becomes really important is kind of high resolution imagery and really understanding what's going on at the fine scale in the rocks. And so we have two instruments that are designed to, to really understand that. And they're called Pixel and Sherlock. <laughs> and so what Perseverance will do, yeah, Sherlock. <laughs> Sherlock I love it. are called Watson. So we, we brought the sidekick along too. Um, and what they'll be able to do is actually kind of brush off a spot on the rock, grind off the surface, and then investigate just a postage size stamp spot. Uh, yeah. Uh, with big little... magnifying glass. Yes. Get its name of Sherlock, yeah. Exactly. And yeah, right, right. that postage stamp, Pixel will map out where different elements are present. And Sherlock will look for any indication of organics. It'll look for organics or salts using Raman spectroscopy. And so both of those instruments working together will help us identify fine scale features in the rocks, as well as cameras, including Watson, but also mast cam, which is the big camera up on the mast, uh, will help us see, see the signals across larger scales so that we know where to dig in and then exactly where to sample. Cool. And, you know, we've been talking last week and this week on the show uh, about the fortnight of Mars. It's two weeks where it's everything Mars. And, of course, you now Perseverance is now the third spacecraft to get there this week. Uh, and so how do how does Persever how can Perseverance best work uh, alongside the Hope Orbiter from the UAE? as well as the TN-11 mission from China that recently arrived. Yeah, great. Yeah, all of these different missions that we have at Mars are absolutely synergistic. Um, so as we understand more and more from each mission, it helps us interpret the data better for the other missions and we can piece together the bigger story of Mars. Um, the HOPE mission in particular will be kind of monitoring the atmosphere and large scale weather systems around Mars in a way we haven't been able to before. And so when we're tracking things that might affect perseverance, like a dust storm or something, then uh, <laughs> then HOPE will be very helpful in understanding that kind of weather system as it crosses Mars. Perseverance will be able to take synergistic observations in order to understand that dust storm from the ground. Tianwen-1 will also have a orbiter, a lander, and a rover. And every landing site that we get to on Mars, we learn something new. And if we took all of our information about the whole planet from one landing site, it would be like trying to understand all of Earth after just looking at New York City. <laughs> right? Right. It's probably not representative of the whole planet. And so each of these different rover missions may go to very different locations, but then they give us a much better perspective of what we can extend and what really was happening around the planet at these during these ancient times. That's, that's just absolutely amazing. And finally, what is your big hope for the Perseverance mission? What, what do you really hope to find? Step one, I am so excited for landing. <laughs> that <was> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, that's it's definitely a seven minutes of terror moment. Um, after that, I am so excited to see these, these salts that accumulated right in Jezero Crater. They had this big lake, right? Lake Tahoe sized lake filling the crater. But what's fascinating to me is right around the edges of the lake, kind of forming a bathtub ring around the crater, there are these salt deposits that are, are carbonate salts. And carbonate is the salt that forms from carbon dioxide mm -hmm. dissolving. It makes limestone-like rocks. And carbon dioxide, as we know, is really important to warming the planet on Earth and is also critical a component of the atmosphere. It's most of the atmosphere on Mars today. And if we think back to the past when there was liquid water on Mars, if there was a carbon dioxide atmosphere, we should see a lot more of this kind of salt. And so it's been a real struggle with all previous Mars missions why we haven't been able to find this salt, or at least not very much of it. And Jezero Crater just has this great exposure of it in these, these nice bathtub rings. And I am so excited to see that, both because it can tell us about that ancient atmosphere and the lake system, and also because if there are signs of life, that's the kind of rock that we that we frequently go to on Earth to look for fossils or ancient life here. Wow. Wow. So incredible. Well, thanks so much for being on the show again, Kirsten. It was it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, you bet. It's really fun. Definitely excited about this landing. Thanks for, thanks for having me. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, congratulations to you and everyone who worked on this mission. It's, it's amazing. And that was Dr. Kirsten Seabach from Rice University, participating scientist on the Perseverance mission to Mars. Continuing our exploration of Mars, researchers at the University of Vienna have successfully grown microbes on authentic Martian soil for the first time. The team ground up a small piece of a Martian meteorite dubbed Black Beauty and placed specimens of M. Sedula, an ancient microbe once present in the hot springs of early Earth, on the sample. They found the microbes were able to thrive and they even built tiny metal-rich capsules within the Martian soil. This study adds to recent findings showing that life may have been quite possible in the crust of ancient Mars. Further from home, a team of astronomers led by Dr. Elizabeth Newton of Dartmouth College discovered three previously unknown planets orbiting a star about 400 light years from Earth. This trio of exoplanets are between two and four times larger than our home world, and they take between two and 16 days to orbit their parent star, TOI 451. The team also found evidence for a disk of asteroids within this planetary system, and this stellar family was seen traveling in a recently discovered stream of stars that stretches far across the night sky. On March 2nd, we're going to talk to Dr. Newton about her discovery. Make sure to tune in then. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Today we're joined by Dr. Fatima Ibrahimi from the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. She has recently envisioned a new sp spacecraft engine that could help us explore Mars and potentially carry us on to more distant worlds. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Fatima Ebdihimi. She is a plasma physicist at um, Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. She's recently come up with uh, some interesting ideas about future plasma engines. Welcome to the show, Fatima. Mm, thank you, thank you, Jim. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so uh, just give us a general idea for people who don't, may not know, uh, what are plasma engines and how do they work? <laughs> yes, so first, um, uh, first I start with the word plasma, which, which we know is basically an um, electrically charged conducting gas. And the idea is that the idea that actually based on my concept is basically um, formation of the donut shape um, or magnetic bubbles or rings of plasmas that are ejected or you know, shoot out from the um, back of the rocket and that's how the rocket can be propelled. So it's all based on how you actually form these magnetic bubbles or plasma rings. And these rings, based on the simulation that I have uh, performed and I have shown in this recent paper, show that these um, 
magnetic bubbles actually um, they have very high exhaust velocity so they are they are actually traveling with about um, 100 to 500 kilometer per second. So the exhaust velocity for these plasma rocket is pretty high or so-called um, specific impulse is pretty high. So it's kind of exceeds the, um, uh, the values for other, um, uh, or for other thrusters or rocket. And that's what basically has been missing a little bit so how can we get high exhaust velocity, you know, in a, in a rocket? And, um, and that's, that's what the basics of it is. And, and actually, interestingly, uh, the idea has come from, if you can look at it, the energy release in this plasma, plasmoid rocket is basically similar to solar flares. Uh, when in solar flares on the surface of the sun, you see these nice, you know, objects, um, very actually, um, you know, flux, we call it flux rope or bundles of magnetic field lines. They actually are ejected from the surface of the sun. And in this process, magnetic energy which we call magnetic reconnection. In this process, magnetic energy is converted to kinetic energy. And uh, what happens during the solar flares, because of that, the process of magnetic reconnection, you see that particles actually travel very fast. You know, they come into the space uh, with really fast, hundred to thousands of kilometers per second. So the idea is basically the rocket is actually, I would just say that is kind of a flare type, solar flare type rocket. And, and that's what the basic of it is, yeah. Hmm. So, the, so the propulsion it, uh -huh. this type is, is delivered in the form of rings or uh -huh. maybe, you know, torus donut shaped, um, it just, now, is, 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 that, is that the same as it is in the current current designs of plasma engines that are being uh, yeah that uh, yeah that's interesting so uh, basically basically there are different types of you know rockets and thrusters out there I mean the basic ones that we know and we have seen you know on TV is basically um, is basically the chemical thrusters and or the t chemical rockets. And they have some limitation, of course, these, you know, these rockets. We know that uh, the specific impulse or the exhaust velocity for these rockets are kind of low. It basically, it means that the fuel efficiency, so-called, the fuel efficiency is kind of low because you basically, the fuel basically, lots, most of the fuel is basically spent by you know accelerating and lifting the fuel, so you need you basically the, the mass efficiency is low for, for these uh, so-called chemical rockets, um, and so there, therefore uh, they have some advantages, but also uh, they're not really practical for you know long uh, distance travel in a space. Mm. So. The, um, it's like taking a uh, truck to a long, you know, road trip, you know, because of the gas mileage is not really as good. Right. So you want something that you kind of be able to cruise at high velocity and have a high gas mileage. And that's when other type of thrusters and rocket, you know, become attractive. And there has been a lot of advances on um, electric propulsion or using electric field, uh, ion thrusters, hull thrusters, you know, to basically accelerate ions. Um, that's also plasma thrusters, accelerate ions to actually get thrust and um, to propel the rocket. Um, and there are actually a lot of, you know, effort has been done over the last few decades and, um, and, uh, and they do provide some of them 
good a specific impulse, but again, not high enough for long distance travel, you know, to Mars and beyond even move. The practicality or fuel efficiency come into play. And um, so they have their own limitation regarding the how much trust they can provide. And uh, so there are electric, um, using electric field to you actually, you can actually produce um, uh, trust in plasma clusters. But the difference between this concept that I, uh, that I recently published is based on the magnetic field. So the, the thing is that the, the idea is that just basically bringing the magnetic field into the picture, um, not on the electric field and the magnetic configuration really has an important role, role for this producing trust and also high specific impulse or high exhaust velocity in this truster. And that's the key difference. And then, then actually, if you have this high specific impulse in this truster, then, then you can actually shorten the trip, of course, the, trip, the, the time for travel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So do you see uh, plasma engines um, with this technology um, being more suited for local travel within our solar system, say, to Mars? This is the week of Mars. Uh, trio exactly. of spacecraft arriving there, which is wonderful. Exactly. Exactly. Um, exactly. So that's what, that's what is needed, some kind of... Um, high electromagnetic, you know, uh, thruster and, or, or rocket for these kind of travels. So it's not basically to, you know, this thruster concept that, I'm, that I have worked, it's not from travel Earth, for example, to low Earth orbit. It's mostly from travel in space. And you're right, it's like, it could be like, a, you know, a car, it could take months or weeks, you know, to travel from one location to another location, if you can produce this kind of, you know, trust and also a specific impulse or exhaust velocity through the process of magnetic reconnection. Yeah. Right. And could the same technology be applied to even robotic interstellar? Crap. Yes, yes. Actually, probably that would be that come first. Uh, really? You can use yes that come like uh, the robotic, you know, moving basically. Um, you using you know uh, for tr probes and everything like yeah. that. You can you you can actually use this kind of electromagnetic thrusters, and um, uh, and they have you know it produces high speed and that's what what you need and the trust is also based on the calculation I have done is pretty good so you can actually you know depending on you know it is fuel efficient and you can you can use it also for um, you know unmanned missions and you know so it is I should say that this is complementary to kind of existing trusters uh, but kind of a little, go beyond um, what it's out there in terms of fuel efficiency because of the high exhaust velocity. Yeah. It's fascinating. Oh and <laughs> yes, and this always comes actually, yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so it's uh, basically the idea that, uh, so I haven't worked actually in a space um, plasma physics, but um, my background is fusion and the idea comes from, from the um, fusion energy, the experiments mm. that we have at the PPPL, at the lab, at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. Um, it's a tokamak, a spherical tokamak experiment. And when I was doing research and um, uh, doing simulation and theory understanding of how, you know, you can inject current into this, you know, tokamak device, uh, which the goal of is, is actually generating fusion energy uh, in this experiment. So I was, I was studying that and I noticed, you know, this formation of these bubbles, these magnetic structures. And, uh, and then, and the fact was that actually these magnetic structures or, or plasma rings, how they were produced in the simulation was pretty interesting to me because it wasn't just that they were all, they were actually formed 
they were actually also continuously formed. So it's like train of bubbles coming out as long as you have a DC, as long, exactly, as long as you have a DC static magnetic and electric field, I saw that these things coming out. And, and so, so the nice thing about this concept is also you don't, it's not externally pulsed, it's actually nature, nature does it for you, basically through the magnetic reconnection process, like what happens on the solar, you know, flare on the, on the surface of the sun, you actually get these kind of generation of these bubbles on its own. Um, it's basically the system pulse itself, you could, you could say that. And so these were just produced and I was like, wow, this is like, these are just coming out as long as I have this steady, uh, electric field and magnetic field, I see this formation of these plasmoids or plasma rings. And, and, then, uh, and then I found that it's actually a really fundamental process um, in magnetic reconnection or, or so-called fast magnetic reconnection. Uh, and that is a transition to something we call plasmoid instability. So you have to have some kind of a knob. We always in physics, you know, we have a knob, you know, we can, you know, if you turn that it up or down, you, su you suddenly get interesting physics. And for us, it was kind of a, something we call it magnetic Reynolds number or Lundquist number or something in plasma physics, which is really a fundamental number in space plasma physics and astrophysical plasma physics and fusion plasma physics. So turning that knob, it kind of created, you know, this kind of transition to this kind of plasmoid, continuous plasmoid formation. And that was based on, based on that. And, uh, uh, and to me, that was pretty interesting that it was actually continuous formation of that. And, um, and then I predicted that these things could happen in the experiment because that was simulation and theory. And then I went back and talked to experimentalists and we actually looked at the camera images and we found that yes, actually this structure have formed in previous you know, camera images in, in the experiment and we published the paper, but that was before the truster concept. And then, then later I came up, you know, um, then I, you know, a couple of years ago, they decided well, what can I use this, you know, for actually plasma uh, thrusters uh, as a thruster for rockets, you know, so-called reconnecting plasma thruster, and that's what I called it. Mm -hmm. Wow, so much promise. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. uh, so finally, where, where do we go from here? Where, how do we, how do we bring these fantastic new engines to life? Yeah, so the, there has been some proof of uh, principle in the experiments you know, at the lab, at Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. So what we need to do is basically uh, building a prototype, you know, build the experiment. And the simulation, of course, have been realistic. You know, when we do theory and simulation in plasma physics, usually we have to, whatever we do, we have to confirm it, we have to validate it against some experiment. So it's kind of realistic what kind of, you know, magnetic field you use, the coils you use and all those things. So, so the, the simulation are promising. And uh, so we just need to basically uh, build this kind of rockets. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. it's, it's looking forward to it. So thank you so much for being on the show. Mm -hmm. It was great talking with you. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. And that was Dr. Fatima Ebrahimi, a plasma physicist at Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. Join us next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion when we talk with Dr. Elizabeth Newton, astronomer at Dartmouth College who just discovered three new worlds around the dwarf star TOI 451. And on March 16th, we're going to be joined by the world's best known astrophysicist, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Subscribe or follow today and never miss an episode. 
And we're happy to announce that Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion has just been named the best astronomy podcast in the world by the editors of starlust.org. Thanks to every one of our listeners and viewers for all of your support. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. And we depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Mm -hmm.